so, uh, Antonio, uh, were you born in San Sebastian? I was born right here, yes. Yeah, so he was born <laughs> right here. <laughs> Not like uh, Anot, who was born in the hospital. Um, anyway, so Antonio, uh, he's a lecturer here in the philosophy department, and he uh, does research in the philosophy of biology and sociology of biology. And well, actually, he does research in lots of things. And he loves holidays in Iceland. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and he's yeah. going to talk about Iceland. I'm no. going to give you a full report on my last holiday. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, my I work in, in bioethics, uh, but my, my department is in, in anthropology. So I'm something like an amateur anthropologist. Uh, and thank you, Jaume, for allowing me to, to, to present this kind of work in progress, which is not a strictly historical, but more... Uh, ethnographical or anthropological. But first, uh, this is the unofficial title of the presentation. Uh, and a little question. These two buildings, one of them uh, took uh, more than 10 years to be built, and the other one less than two. Uh, can you tell which is, wh which is which? Those pictures come from Reykjavik last September. Any chances? Th they are very close to each other. Sorry? Yes, <laughs> so you go. Drop a coin. Which one? The, wor the one on the right is the, the fast one. The, the fastest. Yes, this is the Decode Genetics uh, headquarters in Reykjavik. It took about two years to, to be built. And this is a part of the life sciences faculty for, at the University of Iceland. It took more than 10 years. Both, uh, I'm going to explore, but somehow this presentation is about uh, things built on promises, and both of them are, are built on promises, but both of them were built at a very different pace and speed. Decode uh, genetics, this is a story that probably is, is familiar to some of you, so I will be, I'll try to be very fast, but was a, a genetics company that was created about 15 years ago and that got into a very convoluted story with the Icelandic government and some big pharma companies. And that is more or less the, the story I, I want to, to tell. But first, some, some credit, where credit is due. I, I, what I, I tried to, to, to do, I have been doing this uh, drawing on previous work with collaborators from our philosophy of biology group, as Ancha Echeverria, and also uh, I am heavily drawing, drawing upon Mike Fortune's book, which is probably the most interesting and complete uh, uh, account of the decode uh, controversy. Uh, he is an anthropologist, and I want to supplement it, but it's, it was published in 2008, so my aim is more or less to supplement, to take where, where Mike... Uh, uh, left it uh, and, and continue a little bit the story because the story is, is not over. What I tried to do is to, to provide a, a partial account of the role of promises in, this, in, this in the creation of this biobank, in this, with the, the creation of this decode company, and the crisis that almost destroyed it or at least uh, transformed it. Uh, the, the decode is still going on, it's still operating, but it has suffered uh, bankruptcy uh, as a result of the financial and economic crisis that we, we know. But I wanted to first, uh, things first, to express my gratitude to these authors. And my personal take on, on promises, and this is going to be very short, uh, at this stage in the, in the workshop, I think that, well, more or less we can agree that promises cover the somehow fussy ground between hype and, and contracts, or formal contracts, uh, hopefully, you know, helping us to walk from, from one to the other, from hype or hopes uh, towards uh, contracts and, and results. And also, at this stage, we can more or less agree that modern science is essentially a forward-looking activity. I think uh, Jaume mentioned that yesterday, quoting Bacon. So therefore, it always involves some kind of promising. But with human biomedicine, human biomedical research, we go a step further because, because biomedicine deals with human uh, biological material, 
it needs to make special promises to the humans that are willing or not to give their blood and data. So special promises take place in this field of, of human biomedical research. So of course, uh, biomedicine is uh, big science. At the end of the 20th century, it became a very big thing. And all research, all science needs, especially big science, needs to legitimate itself in front of society because it needs funding and it needs academic recognition. But in the case of biomedical science, this is uh, emphasized because scientists need to convince you know, r normal people, sick or healthy, that uh, it's a good thing uh, that, they can, that they give some, some human uh, mater uh, biological material. So uh, and that's where promises uh, uh, take in. Um, the World Biobank uh, is, very, is, quite, is very new. It began to, to be widely used in the year 2000. Before, uh, they were called genetic databases. And basically, they are collections of biological samples, in, including blood and other tissues, and also the associated health information. Of course, uh, in the forthcoming decade, this last 10 to 15 years, there has been a lot of debate about the ethical, legal, and social issues concerning biobanks. And I hope John will give us uh, a full report about the the epistemological and historical uh, details about the LC approach. I'm going to focus only on, on, on biobanks, only in just one biobank, uh, the decode one, which has been by far the most debated and, and discussed. Well, a little chronology. I will be very, very fast because some of you know uh, most, most of this uh, story. Uh, Kauri Stefansson was an Iceland-born uh, geneticist who who became a professor in, at, in Harvard, but then left Harvard uh, to, to, to Iceland again with a project uh, uh, backed up by, by $12 million in, in venture capital. He was a friend of the uh, prime minister at, at the time, David Otson. Uh, he established uh, the, the company in Reykjavik, and the big news, uh, this, uh, this made it into nature, was that in February 98, uh, he got, he signed a deal with a big pharma company such as Hoffman Roach. Uh, Roach uh, promised to give the code at uh, $200 million in return to something that didn't exist, that was exclusive rights to the exploitation of a tool, a database that didn't exist at the time, but that was promising some big results in the identification of uh, certain genes having to do with certain common diseases. This is the, the most important slide here. This is the, the brainchild of Corey Stephenson, uh, which was not only one database, but three actually. First, uh, with, with perhaps the, the, the Mormons in Utah, Icelanders have the best genealogies in, in the world. They are completely historical and, and literate society, so they have very good genealogies, which are in the public domain. They also have a, a very, uh, quite good uh, public health care system. And uh, the idea was to cross three different databases, the genealogical one, the healthcare data one, that was, uh, and this was the most controversial part of, of the whole deal, that was obtained with the presumed consent of the Icelandic population, meaning that either if people didn't uh, step out hmm, by, by, by doing so, uh, people were presumed that they were willing to, to, to provide their data. And then, of course, more usual uh, kind of uh, uh, genotypic data having to do with um, specific research uh, projects in which blo uh, blood and tissue samples were extracted, but with full uh, traditional informed consent. Uh, using the health sector database and the, that other types of data, mm, uh, genetic, uh, genomic research was uh, meant to take place in order to create basically this, uh, uh, drugs and, and, diagno and diagnostical uh, tools. 
some other things were created, like app, uh, applications for you know, mobile genealogies and things like that. But this was, the, of course, the, the promise that, that uh, was behind the $200 million deal. OK. Uh, this was explained in a Nature article, and then very quickly, uh, the uh, Corey's friend, uh, David Hudson, tried, tried to, to, to put this bill, creating the health sector database, through the, the Icelandic government. Uh, still, after the publication in Nature, uh, the medical establishment in Iceland got very nervous, because of course some new rules were being introduced, that thing about presumed consent. Uh, and also a few other things. For instance, Roach pr uh, promised that the Icelandic uh, people will get free drugs from uh, those hypothetical uh, treatments that, that could be the result of the, of, the, of the database. And they were not completely happy with that, this idea of, you know, are we going to be guinea pigs for the rest of the, of the world? So they created a non-governmental organization that uh, put a lot of pressure uh, into the, the government so that they, uh, they stopped uh, provisionally the whole thing. And they even wrote uh, to, to Nature, uh, saying that, uh, expressing their concern. I like this because the word promising appears too, as well. <laughs> but uh, still, uh, the opposition was not strong enough. Uh, they could have very powerful friends and, and, and very good news uh, to, 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 to bring about. And, and they, were, they, they, they promoted their idea all through the Icelandic uh, geography. So eventually they, they got the, their bill approved uh, with some opposition. And David the, uh, got uh, again re-elected. Uh, he's probably the, the most, st the, the guy that, that, that was prime minister for longer, for longest in, in, in recent Icelandic history. And... Uh, to, uh, and, and they decided to, to, to block the opposition by uh, firing Einar Arnarsson from the National Bioethics Committee. They completely renewed the whole national, national Bioethics Committee. Those independent, uh, uh, independent parties that were supposed to control the whole issue, the whole process, well, uh, they were recreated, renewed, uh, in order to, to please uh, Decode, so to speak. Well, the, the good news even continued. Uh, Decode uh, got bigger and uh, so big that it got into NASDAQ. They, they, they sold uh, shares in, in, the, in the financial market, uh, a lot of them actually, uh, almost 200 million. And they were able to, to, to strike some kind of provisional compromise with the Icelandic Medical Association. A stable one, but still they could uh, begin their, their, their work. Still uh, trouble was about to, to happen. Oh my god, I, I forgot to put my chronometer on. Please John, tell me if I, if I step out of bounds, okay? Uh, uh, one person sued the Director General of Public Health uh, over the, the right or not to, to put their her father's data into the health se the sector database. Uh, meanwhile, the code got even bigger. The, the, that building was opened. Uh, David uh, won uh, just another election. But 2,000 Icelanders opted out of the health sector database. And that's quite a lot in a population of about 200, 300,000 uh, people. Eventually, after a few years, the Supreme Court decided that it was that uh, dead people could not be put into the database. So that uh, at least part of the uh, bill, of the legal backup uh, the, uh, for the health sector database was not constitutional. And that was a big blow to, to the code. Which, but uh, of course, uh, new things were, were in the horizon. And very soon, uh, the, the big crash came, the big uh, financial collapse. Of course, this uh, uh, all over the world, but in Iceland, because it's such a small society, it's such fragile, so fragile, uh, it was very, very hard. Uh, the three main banks collapsed, 
and, there were, uh, and uh, people took to the streets and they eventually ousted the, the Icelandic government in, in January, early uh, 2009. Eventually they got a new uh, leftist uh, government and the first woman to become prime minister. And shortly after, uh, uh, the code uh, went into bankruptcy. Uh, they had uh, accumulated a huge debt and, and, and they, they wanted to sell. So, as you know, uh, well, Icelandic became, uh, appeared a lot on the news because they tried to redraft uh, their constitution. They didn't succeed, actually, because of, they, uh, uh, basically, well, in legalese, but basically, uh, they, Mm, there was a, uh, some kind of problem with the way that a commission was elected, so again the whole thing was halted uh, and the constitution stays as it was and as you know, uh, you know the, the, the independence bar party is back in, in, in government. So uh, things are more or less back into, 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 use, into useful business. But the code is not owned by Kauri Stephenson and, and Roach anymore, but, but uh, uh, another pharma, big pharma company, an American one, Amgen. Uh, the last news is that uh, still the code is, is trying to work as usual, but it's, now it's, been, uh, it's working under a lot of constrictions. Uh, something has changed in Iceland. Uh, David Dodson is not in government anymore. So the kind of um, space for maneuver that uh, the code has, has restricted a lot. Also, it has to, to, to it's not an independent company anymore. It has, it's, it's dependent on MJ's policy. Okay, well, let's, let's not rush it. Uh, well, the, the promise in the structure in, in all this is quite cl clear. All right, thank you, Jaume. Uh, so the, the 200 million figure created a lot of buzz, a lot of hype. It represented a promise that could or could not be fulfilled depending on, on future research milestones. So the whole thing was based on, on, on this, was forward looking. Uh, but problems and solutions, as John Agar said, doesn't, mm, don't make a, 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 a promise. Promises require exchange and, and obligation. And exchange had to do with samples, with data, and that's where, where, where the main trouble uh, appeared. When people uh, refused or didn't want to uh, li uh, liberate their data to third parties. Mm, what can we learn about, about all this? Uh, of course, uh, uh, Iceland uh, was hit by, by the crisis, uh, unemployment ro rose a lot, and, and, and although recovery has been fast, it, it's, not, it's far from, from complete. Uh, the, code, the, the, the code said that the crisis, the Icelandic crisis did not affect them because they lost money, but they lost the, the money that was put on American banks, so basically on, uh, the, uh, their money was managed by Lehman Brothers. Bad move. Uh, but contrary to what they say, I suspect that the ethos, the ethos, the, the moral uh, milieu, the moral climate that helped create the code in such a little time, that helped you know build this this uh, building, was not disconnected from the ethos, from the methods, and from the cultural milieu behind the financial crisis that brought. Uh, the code and many other uh, businesses to bar bankruptcy. So the decode story shows that Icelandic society was very receptive to the promises of science, but also that somehow uh, haste makes waste, that uh, everything was rushed. Uh, high expectations were created and the fast turn of events uh, eventually eroded trust and trust in biomedical research is the most important asset that one scientist can have, more important than, than blood or blood or data. Mm, in order to, to uh, there is a, a couple of researchers from Australia who have been doing work on uh, empirical work in, on, 
on the informed consent process. And I think uh, it's, uh, informed consent is a, is a key here because uh, the, the way the code did it, by presumed consent, offered a fast way to secure the data, but overlooked the, 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 the symbolic dimension of informed consent as an enactment of the mutual trust that makes promises worth the while. So, uh, and this is a, uh, an, exempt, an excerpt from, from an informant uh, you know, report about why, what is informed consent for her or him. Basically, he, he or she says that by he, he, cannot, she, he or she cannot understand what's going on, but by signing the informed consent form, he or she says that uh, they trust the, those guys. And on the other hand, that those guys, the scientists, are going to do what they do they are, they are meant to, to, to do. So instead of doing this, instead of building up this trust on a one by one basis, slowly, the code tried to quickly secure and sell a tool by means of a promising frenzy. But the code never delivered one of those promised treatments, uh, just kept changing its promises along with its strategy depending on the, on the scenario. They provided good basic science that I don't deny. They have been publishing uh, a lot of press releases and, and a, a number of uh, scientific journals about specific locations for, for some genes. Uh, but not a single uh, drug or diagnostic treatment. So, uh, to summarize, mm, hasty promises were, were made and everything was forced down, uh, forces down uh, the throats of the Icelander, of the Icelandic people. Why? Well, I think that we can find an answer by looking at the ethical social factors behind the, the economical crisis and with this I will end. Just three minutes. Uh, this comes from our, our own uh, field work. We, uh, last September, we, uh, and a colleague and I, we were interviewing some, some key actors in the, in the in politicians and academics mostly in, in Iceland. And this is a few things that they say which I think can be relevant to understanding uh, what, what happened in these 15 years. Basically, uh, it was a, a matter of speed. Uh, uh, they got very fast into the modern world, in the modern economy. And, well, uh, more about the economy later. Here, the problem was a, a problem of time management. In all the pro uh, this informant number four is, is talking about the process of reforming the constitution. And basically, she, she said that they couldn't do it because it was all too rushed. Uh, informant number five speaks about this being almost a a uh, character trait of the Icelandic people uh, who, who have to do everything uh, very quickly. Also in the economy, this is also a problem because they, 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 their bankers uh, were very fast. And, uh, and as a result, very uncritical of, of the way that uh, things were being done. <coughs> Eventually, and as a conclusion, I will end with uh, no conclusions, but with just a, 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 a quotation that I think is, is relevant and suggestive. It comes from Mike Fortune himself. Uh, the saga is not over, uh, the code is still working, and Mike Fortune uh, is reluctant to, to pass judgment on, on, on what has been happening. Uh, what he says is that mm, I am reluctant also to, to pass judgment. I don't think bioethics is about passing judgment on, on scientists. But he suggests that uh, we should, this is a fissure, this is a, uh, an area where agreement is still far, uh, uh, far away. Uh, and genomics is a territory that is still very unstable and liquid, you know, liquid as lava. So we, all, not all, we, we don't live in Iceland, but uh, as Mike says, we live in lava land, all of us, especially when we deal with, with this kind of, of science. And in such a territory, uh, th this cannot be wholly controlled or, 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 or solved, no? but, uh, he says, can be more or less inhabited, can be more or less carefully uh, uh, governed. I think he implies that for the last 15 years, it hasn't. It hasn't uh, hasn't been 
uh, careful enough. Uh, um, probably because it has, this has happened very, very quickly. But I will leave it here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Antonin. We do have uh, kind of a few minutes for questions and comments. And I love that everyone has decided that promise means something different in different contexts, which is, <laughs> I guess, the, the, the goal of this uh, workshop. So, Masi? Just uh, very quickly. Uh, at some point, you said that uh, Island, uh, Island uh, seemed recept receptive to the, to the promises of science. But it seems that this story is more a story of an elite imposing upon the, the, um, the, the country this, this kind of decision. And I think I'll, I, I guess that the scale of the country here is also a factor, right? It seems that there mm. are very few people involved that, that make the decision, then they uh, run this thing, and then when, when, when troubles can start to pop out, then, then, then people said, well, maybe it's mm. not that, that easy. So it seems more a story that comes from the elite to, mm. the, to the country. Uh, yes, or yes, or yes, no, 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 yes. Uh, I agree, but but with a qualification, um, they got a lot of support from from normal people, the people in the street, because they went to uh, to village by village. What they forgot was the to 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 they didn't uh, uh, get the the complicity of perhaps the middleman or middlewoman, the medical establishment the academics, uh, which were the ones that uh, created the opposition. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is true that it was a, a small group with the strong and, and, uh, connections with the government and the local elites, but that managed because of the hype, you know, and using some kind of you know, patriotic discourse saying, well, we're going to put Iceland in the, in the map again and, and create lots of jobs and bring all this money uh, 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 and this was happening, you know, around the year 2000, and everyone was talking about genomics at that time, as you all know. So uh, this was used to, to, to create a lot of buzz, a lot of excitement, and a lot of support from, from many people, yes. Thank you. My, mine is a very similar question. What, what is the public perception of this idea of promise that permeates your, your discourse? Like how people really understood the promises of this massive mm -hmm. enterprise from the, from the people's per perspective. That's it's well, a very similar question. Mm, Are you planning to well, interview I mean, them? Are you planning to talk to them? Well, uh, there has been uh, a lot of... <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, a lot of research has been done uh, in these 15 years. Uh, I think initially people were very ready to give it a try mm, because the, it was a very optimistic uh, time, you know, the, uh, up to 2007, uh, it seems that, you know, uh, things were going grand, things were going swell. Uh, mm, so there was some kind of consensus, uh, especially in uh, for the position of the government and the position in polls, that, well, they, 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 uh, as long as they don't harm anyone, let's, let's uh, give it a, a try. This kind of tolerance ended with in 2008. So now the situation is much more restricted and, and difficult for, for them. And I think many of the things you said link very well with what Harold was saying yesterday and those graphs he showed about investment in science. Mm -hmm. and the whole thing of inflation of promises in this kind of out of control speed mm -hmm. that suddenly yeah. it just bursts. Yes, yes, eventually we are now in the plateau, getting to the plateau, yes. <laughs> Okay, so I promised to go a coffee break, and I'm going to deliver a coffee break uh, in the usual place. <laughs> <laughs>